Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a quick review of To Kill a Mockingbird by Harper Lee. So, I read this for Catalyst Reads Rereadathon. By this point, I have no idea what the challenges are, I just know what books I'm supposed to be rereading. This is probably one of my most reread books of all. I reckon I've read it between six and eight times, something like that. I actually don't remember when I first read it, but I don't think it was for school. I think I picked it up off my own back. And then maybe we did it at school, I don't really remember. Uh, this time, I listened to it via an audiobook. I actually started listening to it with Becca, but then she basically didn't want to listen to the rest of the audiobook. She said the narrator annoyed her, and I don't think she was particularly into the story. Whereas, I've kind of read it so many times now, it was like going back to an old friend. I actually stopped noticing the narrator and stopped realising it was an audiobook, and binged on about the last six or seven hours of it in one go. So, uh, it was though, the audiobook was recorded and released before I was born I think it was 1987 it was recorded so it was an older audio book so there is that I guess um, but yeah I thought it was pretty good I'm gonna read the blurb and then I'm gonna go through some of my notes it's a bit different to how I normally do my reviews because normally if I'm actually physically reading the book I just tab out the pages whereas in this case I have uh, put it all into a notepad document should make it easier for me in editing I guess so the blurb Shoot all the Blue Jays you want, if you can hit them. But remember, it's a sin to kill a Mockingbird. A lawyer's advice to his children as he defends the real Mockingbird of this enchanting classic, a black man charged with the rape of a white girl. Through the young eyes of Scout and Jem Finch, Harper Lee explores with exuberant humour the irrationality of adult attitudes to race and class in the deep south of the 30s. The conscience of a town steeped in prejudice, violence and hypocrisy is pricked by the stamina of one man's struggle for justice, but the weight of history will only tolerate so much. That's a pretty good blurb for it, isn't it? So I'm going to start my review by highlighting uh, a quote from Dill. I do like Dill, he's a good character. He's not my favourite character, I'll get to that in a minute. Uh, I think my favourite character has actually changed for this reading, but Dill gave this great quote, he goes, You got anything needs reading, I can do it. That's my American accent for you. That was that was pretty much how the uh, narrator of the audiobook was reading throughout. She also kept calling uh, Cunningham. She kept calling him Cunningham. She'd be like, Cunningham came over. I don't know. I went to school with someone called Paul Cunningham. Also, they had Birmingham. And I grew up near Birmingham. And my girlfriend, Becca, she calls it Birmingham. She, she doesn't pronounce the G. So basically... Nobody was pronouncing things correctly. The white lady was, I assume she was white. She sounded white. That's probably racist in herself. But I'm pretty sure it was a white lady who was reading it. And she kept dropping the N word. Which made me feel uncomfortable. Because I was listening to it with the window open. It was actually interesting listening to this in July during a heat wave in the UK. Because it felt more like, you know, I was there in whatever, Macon County or whatever the the setting of it was. I liked how it talked, how they kind of dumbed down primary school and Scout was getting frustrated with what she was being told she was allowed to learn versus what she was ready to learn, you know. Because I remember, for example, in primary school getting annoyed because they told me I couldn't read properly because I pronounced letters like A, B, C, D. Uh, even said H because I couldn't say H because if I said H... My grandparents, who were English teachers, would tell me off and tell me to pronounce it H. And then I went to school, and then suddenly they're saying it's A, B, K. You know, H became H. And it was just really weird, and they, they treated me like I was dumb for not knowing these the phonics or whatever. And it's like, well, no, I just got taught how to read, mate. Ugh. Uh, one part that I did like, I loved that Boo Radley folded up Jem's clothes when he left them behind. They were running away from the Radley house and uh, Jem, I think it was his, his pants, which for, for us British folk, p pants or underwear, he, he meant his trousers. He left his trousers on the fence uh, and then he went back to get it and Boo Radley had like stitched them together and folded them back up. Another great quote was when Scout was going, the world's ending, Atticus, please do something. And then he was like, no, it's not. It's snowing. I don't know why Atticus sounds like uh, Alec Guinness there, but apparently he does. And then, who is it? One of the characters, I didn't write down who it said. One of the characters said, boys don't cook, which I have been getting really into cooking recently. I appreciate, by the way, this is probably going off on a tangent here, but my reviews aren't necessarily 
like objective reviews of the text or whatever. It's more me highlighting the bits of it that resonated with me and that I thought were particularly powerful or well written or relatable to or not relatable to or whatever. What else do we got? Oh, the rabid dog that Atticus takes down. I really like that element of Atticus's character actually, that he used to be like a champion shot, but he doesn't want to take lives and this relates back to the quote you know it's a sin to kill a mockingbird he does he thinks it's a sin to kill anything really without a just reason to and obviously he does have a reason to kill the dog and so he does he shoots it but that was sad as well because i like dogs it also gave me vibes of cujo by stephen king as well another scene that i really really liked and that i hadn't really appreciated before i don't think is when uh, scout and gem go along with calpurnia to the black church and the white kids aren't welcome there there's this you know them versus us mentality and it's this if it, it, you know i can't blame you or you can't blame as the reader the black folk for not welcoming scout and gem to the to their church when you know you see what's happening to the black people in the knoll there is still very much a time of segregation and it in the black people in the case of the black people and their church it's not that they don't want to be welcoming it's a self-preservation thing you know Calpurnia as well is described as not looking her age and she says in the novel colored folk don't show their age so much which reminded me of black don't crack which is apparently a, th a th saying I learned that from BuzzFeed so you know Although it does hold true, according to the BuzzFeed video, so, <laughs> you know. But um, this is when I realised that Calpurnia, for me, is an underrated character. I like the way that she acted differently around the black people than she did when she's working for Atticus. I've got another note down here saying, Cunningham, not Cunningham. That's twice I noted that down, so that must have grated on me enough that it was, you know, worth noting for me. But at the same time... I think it's true to the way the people in the novel speak. It's just alien to my ears, you know? There is a part as well which I've picked up on more this read in terms of the people of the town. The reason that they're against Atticus defending a black man isn't just because he was assigned to defend him, but because he wants to defend him too. He's not just throwing the fight. He's displaying integrity. He's put it, doing everything he can. To make sure that justice is served, you know. He's just doing his job, basically. And, you know, he gets looked down upon because of it. We have a, a moment which I think is quite telling of uh, Miss Maella. When uh, she thinks in the courtroom, she thinks that Atticus is being sassy or sarcastic when he calls her ma'am or Miss Maella. And uh, the reason that he does that is because he's being courteous. But she thinks he's being sarcastic because she's never experienced that before. I also thought it was very powerful in his arguments during the court scenes. Atticus said that the only crime that has been committed was that his client had the temerity to feel sorry for a white woman. I took more of a feminist message from it this time as well. I've usually just focused on the race side of things, but obviously it does have a lot to say about feminism, particularly in the way that uh, Scout is treated by her relatives who are saying, you know, you need to dress like a real girl. And then she asks Atticus if the way she dresses and acts bothers him. And he's like, doesn't bother me. I'm pretty sure that's not an actual line from the book, but you know. It also has a lot to say about childhood and just the nature of people in general. It's not just a race book, it's a life book. I think this is Boo Radley, but I can't remember who said it now. Uh, I didn't write it down, unfortunately. But the quote, I came to the conclusion that people were peculiar and so I withdrew from them. And I think I've been guilty of doing that as well. But I, at, I am actually at a point in my life where I want to spend more time with people and just put some more effort into interpersonal relationships. You know, I, I, I can be guilty of letting it slip and I don't want that to happen. I'm getting too old for that shit and people are going to start dying. So, you know. Live every day as if it's your last. All right, and one final quote, which is Scout talking to Jem about, like, Hitler and the war and things on the radio and that kind of stuff. And she goes, Jem, how can you hate Hitler so bad and then be so ugly about the folks at home? This is what the narrator of the audiobook was doing the accent like. So I don't know whether this is accurate, but... It's a pretty good impersonation of the reader of the audiobook, if nothing else. Maybe that might explain to you why it's kind of annoying. I think uh, Time for Books said that the narrator was annoying as well, because there was a little clip of it in my uh, reading vlog when I was reading this book. And in fact, I will link to that below so that you can kind of see more of my take on this while I was reading it as well. Well, while I was rereading it. 
But yeah, all in all, I mean, it's a classic. I love To Kill a Mockingbird. I love the film with Gregory Peck in it as well. I think I will probably reread it several more times in the course of my life. And it's just one of those books everyone should read. So if you're putting it off, get to it. And I'm going to rate it now. Five out of five. It's a classic. It's a masterpiece. It is what it is. Although I haven't, I haven't read Ghost Set of Watchmen. But I probably won't. And I don't really want to talk about that here because that's not the point of this video. The point of this video is to kill a mockingbird. And that's what I've been talking about. So, on that note, thanks very much for watching. Don't forget to let me know in the comments if you read this book and if so, what you thought of it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit subscribe for more and I'll see you soon for another one. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.